Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining um, our 2023 Capital Markets event, which we last did two years ago. I'm Deborah Crew, Diageo's Chief Executive Officer. But first, here are our regulatory statements. So here's our plan for today. First, I will kick things off by discussing the current business environment for the industry in Diageo, highlighting positive trends while also recognizing the challenges that remain. I will also give a bit more color on the RNS shared last Friday. Then I will be recapping the foundational facts about this very attractive industry and Diageo's strong position within it. We are confident that our advantaged portfolio and footprint provides us an industry-leading sustainable growth opportunity. We will then move on to the four key strategies which leverage our competitive advantages and will help us capture this growth. Members of my executive team, management team will join me uh, to bring this to life with examples from around the world. They will showcase how we will use cutting edge consumer insight and move with speed and agility to continue to drive growth in our largest categories with our amazing brands, unleash the power of the portfolio to expand our footprint across the world, innovate to recruit into new occasions, winning with more consumers, and go from strong to stronger by raising the bar on execution. After lunch, we will then get in and have plenty of time for our guidance for the future, and we will close after you hear from our CFO, Lavinia, who will discuss how our growth algorithm is set up to continue delivering consistent results in a volatile world. So let me start by talking about how the current environment is evolving internally and externally. As you are all aware, the external environment continues to be dynamic and volatile. Let me start with the positives. TBA continues to grow and Spirit continues to grow faster than TBA. While consumers show a combination of concern around cost of living and recession, they are also expressing signs of optimism, particularly with regards to our industry. On the other hand, geopolitical volatility is worsening. In addition to the war in Ukraine, which has disrupted the market for over a year now, we also have rising geopolitical tensions in the Middle East impacting several markets. This is all leading to increased volatility in commodities. An example of this is the price of oil, which having dropped to around $70 in the spring, is now back at nearly $80. And we are seeing retailers face a variety of pressure points, which I will cover in further detail in a moment. But first, let's dive a little deeper into consumer sentiment. We have a proprietary tracker where we monitor consumer sentiment in our industry on a quarterly basis. And it shows that consumer confidence is actively improving. Their desire to increase spending in alcohol and premium alcohol has gone up by over 12 percentage points from a low point reached in February 2022. We also see other positive signs for the future. 89% of consumers say socializing with friends is more important. 76% won't change what they spend on things that they love and 88% want new experiences 
to make, that make them laugh and smile. As for the upcoming holidays, our U.S. tracking is showing more, is showing positive momentum in planned holiday spending relative to last year. This includes holiday spending overall, spending on name brand alcohol, trips to the on-premise, and holiday gatherings. For the on-premise, there is an overall 10% plan net improvement versus last year. And these indicators give us the confidence that our brand investments can continue to yield positive results as we move through this volatile environment. While consumers are regaining confidence, our customers remain cautious. A persistently tight labor market means the off and especially the on trade are still dealing with staff shortages that affect their ability to successfully activate our category. And at the same time, high interest rates have added pressure to retailers, and we've seen groups cut back on investments and inventories. This pressure is worldwide and particularly acute in regions such as Latin America, where the impact of U.S. interest rates is most immediately felt. We are navigating these challenges and the consumer opportunity through a combination of innovation and agility. So now looking at our business in the short term, as we shared on Friday, we are seeing slower than expected growth, and we are no longer expecting fiscal 24 first half to be stronger than fiscal 23 second half. This is due to materially weaker performance in LAC, which um, makes up nearly 11% of Diageo's net sales value. Importantly, we have momentum continuing in four out of five regions, including seeing sequential improvement in our largest region of North America. I will come back and talk about LAC, but let's start with where, what we are seeing in the other 90% of our portfolio. Starting in the east, we are seeing strong momentum in APAC, despite the slower recovery in China. While our Baijiu business is proving to be more resilient, we are seeing less momentum than we expected on the international spirits business, which is true also for the industry in general. In Europe, we still see momentum, although slower than in the second half of fiscal 23, with geographical tensions escalating, trading has unfortunately stopped in key geographies in the Middle East, where we hold leading positions in spirits. In Africa, we do expect to see improvement in the rate of net sales growth in the first half of fiscal 24 compared to the second half of fiscal 23. And finally, in North America, we also expect sequential improvement in organic net sales growth in the first half of fiscal 24 compared to the second half of fiscal 23. So diving a little deeper into the US, the category which grew between four to 6% historically peaked at double digit growth in the COVID super cycle and dropped back for a time in between as we lapped reopenings and a return to pre-COVID activities. Now, <clears throat> the spirits industry growth is nearly mid single digit. While we're not yet back to winning share in TBA, Trends have stabilized, and we are taking bold steps to change the trajectory. And you're going to hear more about that from Sally and Claudia later today. Given the interest in this topic, I will once again address wholesaler inventory levels in the U.S. In summary, at the end of fiscal 23, I was comfortable with the U.S. distributor inventory levels. And if you recollect, elevated demand during the pandemic drove inventory to severely low levels. This was particularly true on our most popular brands, such as Crown Royal and Bullet. We leveraged our supply chain capabilities through fiscal 21 and fiscal 22 to get product to distributors and get back on retailer shelves as quickly as possible. <clears throat> At the same time, we saw distributors increase inventories of our imported products <clears throat> in response to the shipping and logistical challenges in fiscal 22. And in fiscal 23, distributor inventory levels were in line with pre-COVID historical levels. So as we've moved into fiscal 24, nothing has changed. We remain a sellout culture focused on running the business the right way. So now let's discuss the current situation in LAC. The business grew 20% in the first half of last year versus a 15% four-year CAGR. So to begin with, we are lapping a high comp. But the following three things have also happened. First, if you recall, during our results at the end of the last fiscal, we said that we ended the year with higher inventory levels in Latin America and specifically in Brazil. We also talked about the weaker consumer environment during the World Cup and after that led to that buildup. Going into this fiscal, the team expected to have worked through this 
by the end of the first quarter. Unfortunately, macroeconomic pressures have persisted, resulting in lower consumption than expected and consumer downtrading. For perspective, currently in track channels, spirits is down around 5% fiscal year to date in Latin America. We are gaining share in most markets, the main exception being Mexico. But regardless, this has slowed down the region's ability to work through channel inventory to manage to appropriate levels for the current environment in the marketplace. Finally, unlike in developed markets, so like NAM and Europe, there is more limited point of sale data available. So while we have good visibility in inventory levels through our distributors, we have less visibility to inventory at the wholesalers and the retailers that they sell to. We've taken multiple rounds of pricing through fiscal 22 and 23, and in an environment of benign interest rates, these channels also may have purchased ahead of anticipated consumption. We do have a very experienced team in LAC, and they would normally be able to recognize this is happening and prevent it. But in an environment of extreme volatility through the COVID super cycle, in some places like Mexico, it was hard to see through what part of this was true consumption growth versus inventory increases in these opaque layers. This also makes it difficult to predict precisely how quick we can move through this disruption. The upcoming holiday season is an important consumption time period, and the team has robust retail activity scheduled. So for perspective, historically, LAC has sold 63% of its annual scotch sales in the first half, with the majority of depletions happening in the October, November, December time frame. We absolutely recognize the magnitude of this and are putting together the right action steps to manage it. I will come back to you during interim results in January 2024 to give you more information and status on those actions being taken. <clears throat> but this is an isolated issue. We have been and remain a sellout culture. Also remember our LAC region, NF23, was around 60% on a constant basis bigger than four years ago and continues to be margin accretive to the group. Most importantly, the rest of our regions, which is 90% of our portfolio, are on their expected trajectories. <clears throat> so as we said on the call last week, we still expect to see growth and gradual improvement through fiscal 24. While there are many green shoots, we also continue to experience headwinds and the operating environment is likely to remain challenging. These are, however, short-term challenges and we run this business for the long term. We will continue to invest in our brands as I am confident in the resilience and growth potential of our business, which will generate substantial and sustainable value for you, our shareholders. So let's move on to why I have confidence in the long-term growth trajectory of the business. So let's start with the industry that we play in. TBA is a large category and it's growing. Two, international spirits is growing faster than TBA, driven by favorable consumer trends. And three, Diageo is well positioned to win as we have great strength of brands, footprint, capabilities, and talent. I will cover each of these in more detail. TBA is almost one trillion US dollars, substantially bigger than non-alcoholic categories combined. TBA has grown for over a decade with strong value and reliable volume growth. These trends are expected to continue into the future. Strong consumer demographics underpin the growth in the total beverage alcohol market. We expect 600 million new legal purchase age or LPA consumers to enter the market by 2030. India is expected to account for a quarter of LPA growth. The expanding middle class around the world should further contribute to industry growth. Moreover, alcohol bev alcoholic beverages are a small fraction of consumer spending, and there is clearly room for this to grow as disposable incomes grow. We believe the low level of spend on our category is also a key driver of the resilience of the category, which I will cover in a few minutes. Moving on to international spirits, this has been growing ahead of TBA, effectively recruiting and gaining share from beer and wine occasions. Over the past five years, international spirits have grown value at 6% CAGR, 1.4 times faster than TBA, 
contributing to roughly a third of TBA value growth. Looking ahead, we expect international spirits to grow at 5% CAGR in retail sales value, or RSV, ahead of TBA at 4% per year. So why is spirits gaining share from beer and wine? Well, because spirits is a particularly attractive category that offers consumers a breadth of participation choices, from casual gatherings over food at home to high-tempo celebrations and convenient formats, spirits play in a wide range of occasions. As many of you saw on our culture wall last night, spirits play in many occasions in popular culture. This shows up through inclusion in popular movies and songs to sports sponsorships and creative artist collaborations. Finally, it has a much wider price ladder than categories such as beer or wine. Spirits can appeal to several consumer segments and accommodate shifts in repertoires and different price tiers, depending on the occasion or motivation. This supports consistent, resilient growth regardless of the economic environment and consumer behavioral shifts. Spirits is also a dynamic category because it capitalizes on macro consumer trends. Take premiumization, for example. Consumers are clearly choosing to drink better, not more. In the last 10 years, premium and above spirits grew from 25% of category value to almost 35%. Super premium plus spirits have grown in value more than two times faster than other price tiers in the category. This price tier gained almost 700 basis points of share of international spirits, RSV, since 2012. A second key consumer trend is wellness, and as consumers prioritize this, they look for moderation, lower calorie alternatives, and more natural ingredients. This has fueled the, the growth of spirits in many areas. The fact that tequila's keto diet friendly is one example, and the growth of non-alc spirits would be another example. Non-alcohol spirit products, while still small, have grown 13 times since 2017. Convenience is already a significant part of many CPG categories, including TBA. Ready to drink has been the fastest growing segment of TBA for several years. Increasingly, consumers have begun trading up from beer and malt-based convenience into the higher priced spirit-based products as well, as directly recruiting new LPA plus drinkers. And importantly, international spirits is a very resilient category. This has proven out during the biggest economic downturn of the last 20 years, the global financial crisis in 2008-2009. During this time, the category grew <clears throat> despite GDP contraction. In the US, for example, spirits were three and a half times less impacted than TBA, despite the increased unemployment across all income groups during this time period. As we look at Diageo, within the most vibrant parts of TBA, we have an advantaged portfolio that has the broadest range of regions, categories, and price tiers. So starting with the brand portfolio, we lead many of the largest international spirits categories and are number one in international spirits in RSV globally, 1.4 times bigger than the nearest spirits competitor. In fact, we are bigger than four of our top 10 competitors combined. Scotch and tequila have been the biggest drivers of our growth, but we have an extensive high quality portfolio that allows us to win wherever the consumer goes. Shui Jingfang was a significant source of growth when Baiju went through its huge premiumization wave. Tangare spearheaded the gin boom, and Guinness continues to thrive in the fastest growing segment of beer. With such a broad portfolio, I have the confidence that we can pivot quickly to changing consumer trends wherever they occur. That being said, while we are custodians of incredible traditional brands, we are not standing still. We are also active portfolio managers. Since fiscal 17, we made 16 acquisitions, all in the premium and above price tiers. Our Casamigos acquisition put us at the forefront of the tequila explosion in North America. Since then, we have acquired other amazing fast-growing brands such as Aviation Gin, 21 Seeds Flavored Tequila, Balcones, American Single Malt, the Premium Rum, Don Papa, and Mr. Black, Cold Brew Coffee Liqueur. Active portfolio management, along with innovation and brand investment, has enabled the continued premiumization of our business. In developed markets, premium and above products gained 18 percentage points of share of net sales value since fiscal 17. 
They now account for over 70% of our NSV. In emerging markets, premium and above gained 13 percentage points of share of our NSV. That said, our business is balanced across price tiers. Scotch and tequila skew premium, but 45% of our sales outside these categories are in the standard and value price tiers. Even within Scotch, our brands and variants cover a wider range of price points. This is important as it gives us optionality through volatility. If we take Johnny Walker as an example in the global financial crisis, Johnny Walker red volume was 50% less affected than the total Johnny Walker volume and allowed us to retain down trading consumers within the franchise. Our portfolio is well balanced, not only across price tiers and categories, but also across geographies. This supports the delivery of long-term, consistent, reliable growth, regardless of the short-term economic volatility that we can experience. This is an advantage we must continuously nurture, including investments to improve our exposure to some of the world's largest and fastest growing consumer markets. In China, we are proud of our participation in Baijiu through Shui Jingfang, putting us in a unique position among global spirits players operating in the market. We are investing in expanding supply of Baijiu, and it was fabulous to see the construction in progress when I visited Chengdu a few months ago. I'm equally excited that our Chinese malt distillery will be operational by the end of the calendar year. Located in Yunnan, it will be carbon neutral and positions us to win in an emerging category with incredible potential in China. In India, we reshaped our participation in mainstream whiskey by divesting and franchising out a significant portion, uh, or a significant portion of the portfolio to focus on where the growth is at in, premium tier, in the premium tiers. Last year, India had the highest growth of super premium plus international spirits, had the highest growth of super premium plus international spirits, excluding global travel. Indian consumers' repertoires are growing with the desire to drink less but better. We are investing in and growing our presence at the top end of the price ladder, both in whiskey and other categories such as tequila. In the US, we continue to invest in brand building and have expanded our capacity for growth. Since fiscal 17, we've almost doubled our absolute AMP investment in the US, taking our reinvestment rate from 15% to 20%. This has supported the 9% CAGR we have delivered on this business over the past four years. We're also investing in capacity expansion to support future growth, including key brands such as Bullet and Crown Royal. In summary, we have an advantage portfolio, which we are continuing to strengthen giving us confidence that we can grow our business ahead of the market. So let's now move to our strategy to continue to drive growth in this dynamic category. Let's start with where we want to go. In 2022, we reached 4.7% value share of TBA. While we're proud of this milestone, we want to go further, adding almost 30 billion new serves globally to reach 6% share of TBA by 2030. This is a vision we've shared before, and despite the short-term volatility and formidable competition, we remain confident about. Our ambition and purpose have not changed either. At Diageo, we are about celebrating life every day, everywhere. We want to be one of the best performing, most trusted and respected consumer products companies in the world. We've laid out the four key growth strategies which I want us to focus on in order to deliver against this exciting ambition. I'll give you a brief overview of the main strategic areas and then my colleagues will explore them further after the break, bringing them to life with a few examples and case studies from around the world. The first is that we need to continue to drive growth in our biggest categories. Our biggest categories are large and growing. As I discussed a few minutes ago, we are the number one company globally by RSV in scotch, tequila, rum, vodka, Canadian whiskey, and liqueurs. In scotch globally, we sell a bottle of Johnny Walker every seven seconds. And we've grown the business at an 8% CAGR over the last four years. And as I've reviewed with you, we believe there's still huge headroom for growth. Growing these categories give us, gives us scale and resilience, and this scale allows us to go after even more opportunities. The second strategy is to unleash the power of the portfolio and expand our global footprint. 
We have sales in nearly 180 countries, and as I described earlier, an incredible portfolio, one which is unrivaled in both the heritage of our brands and the consumers that they reach. And yet, our big brands are not present in many important markets. We have an opportunity to expand our key brands so that more consumers around the world can enjoy them. We also have an opportunity to take what is working in a market and reapply it with speed into other markets. This includes some of our most exciting innovations. Third, we also want to use our superior innovation capabilities to tap into new consumer occasions and recruit into our categories and brands. This is a core strength of Diageo and has been a big driver for us in the past. I'm excited about the pipeline and the scale of what I know is coming in emerging occasions for us like non-alcohol. Lastly, we will continue to raise the bar on execution, winning with consumers and customers. We're known for our scale and the quality of our execution in many areas, yet I believe we can do more. I want excellence in every consumer touch point and also in our end-to-end -end operations. We've driven an annual average of $500 million of productivity in the past several years, which we've stepped up in fiscal 23, which we reinvested into the business. I know we have the opportunity to step change this further. Lavigneau will cover this in more detail later in the day. We will also highlight one of our strongest markets, North America, and how they continue to raise the bar on execution. These growth drivers are all supported by critical enablers. It requires deep consumer understanding, engaged talent, and embedding our spirit of progress plan into everything we do. So let's start with our Society 2030 Spirit of Progress plan. We run our business with the long term in mind. It's our license to operate. It creates a diverse and productive culture for us to thrive. It is the right thing to do in our communities and for the planet where we lay down maturing stock for more than a decade. The Spirit of Progress plan, which we laid out in 2020 when we completed the previous 10-year plan, is a key enabler for us to continue to deliver long-term sustainable growth. I passionately believe that building a resilient business means delivering on our ESG plan. To be clear, Spirit of Progress isn't a nice to do. It truly makes Diageo a better business and it's embedded in everything we do. But we also know it's about being smart and efficient as well. So we look for what we call the triple wins. So what do I mean by that? I mean we will do the right thing that benefits our communities, benefits our customers and consumers, and will also benefit Diageo's bottom line. If you look across our three main areas of ESG, positive drinking, inclusion and diversity, and sustainability, you will see this triple win strategy in action. To bring this to life, um, I will play a quick video that demonstrates how Society 2030 Spirit of Progress plan impacts our business.
A further enabler for us is our engaged workforce. We have over 30,000 talented individuals working with a clear purpose and with speed and agility to deliver our performance. We have a highly competitive employer brand that helps us attract, grow, and retain the best talent in a fiercely competitive talent marketplace. In fiscal 23, we attracted 4,977 new employees to work at Diageo, and we saw a year-on-year -year increase of 22% in applications to join the company. Additionally, 5,092 employees took on new career opportunities within Diageo in fiscal 23. That's 14 people making career moves per day. We know from our annual survey that our employees take ownership and have immense pride for Diageo's brands and performance. The net promoter score for employees recommending Diageo's products was plus 80. For context, an index score of plus 10 to plus 30 is considered great, and anything plus 30 is considered excellent. We have a strong and diverse bench of leadership talent. On diversity, at the end of fiscal 23, 44% of our leadership cohort are female. That's an increase of five percentage points versus the year ending fiscal 20. And 43% are ethnically diverse. In our board, 70% are women and 40% are ethnically diverse. Finally, we are committed to developing the skills and capabilities of our people in line with our future growth opportunities. Employees undertook 526,500 hours of learning and 11,538 digital learning in fiscal 23. But don't just take my word for it. Let's hear directly from some of our employees from around the world. Diageo has a really fantastic culture where we really focus on people and engagement of our people as well as development of the talent that we have. Working for a company that shares my values around equality, equity and diversity is very important to me. I would say Diageo has a very open and warm culture. Everybody in the organization is so approachable. Diage is a very progressive company. It supports women in terms of flexible timings, so you can support your family. Diageo offers a lot of opportunities for growth and learnings. I love the flexibility that we have to craft our own careers, or maybe not even craft them, just sort of follow where the opportunities are. La actitud colaborativa, las ganas de apoyar y saber que todos vamos hacia un mismo fin para lograr el objetivo. Having the opportunity to spend six months parental leave provided relationship building with my children and an opportunity to support my wife. When you get to any place and it says this guy works with Guinness, people start looking at you different. It's just like football players, everybody was the best player to play for the team. And the idea we have the best. Lastly, I would like to talk about two new key tools which we are adding to our suite of tools that we've talked to you about in the past. These tools are enabling us to deliver on our ambition, or these tools are enabling us, yeah, to deliver our ambition. The fact is that we have an opportunity to grow in almost every category and almost every market. And as you will appreciate, we cannot do all at once. These two proprietary tools are helping us focus and prioritize our investments toward our biggest growth opportunities with the highest opportunity for return. The first is the consumer choice framework. It's a methodology that allows us to transcend category thinking and use an occasion-led lens to understand consumer motivations, trends, and opportunities. This tool enables us to direct investments in our portfolio, keep our brands relevant to changing consumer tastes, and capture the growth cycles of categories within TBA at speed. The second tool is the market growth framework, which establishes clear roles for each of our markets based on external and internal factors. And these roles help us define growth priorities, KPIs, and where our investments should be directed. 
Ultimately, it helps us remain agile, act fast, and effectively channel the full power of our scale where it matters in this volatile world. So thank you for your attention. I'm going to now open the floor to Q&A. Remember, this is the first of four opportunities that you will have today. <laughs> So following this, you will then hear from some of my executive leadership team members who will share some compelling examples of how we're executing against the strategic growth drivers that I mentioned moments ago. And I think at this point, I'll invite Lavinia up. And like I said, there's four Q&As. So um, just so you know when those Q&As will break and if we can try to keep sort of the questions within the, the pieces, we'll, it'll just be helpful. Um, this first part on sort of my section on kind of the foundational facts, current context. Then we'll have one again after uh, we've got a lot of the executive team and presidents coming up to present the growth strategies. We'll have actually two in that section. We'll do one that I would say will be more of a focused on rest of world Q&A. And then we have split out a North America Q&A. Um, and then we will also have a Q&A to talk about the medium term guidance after Lavinia and I go through that and to talk about that. So that sort of frames it up. Yeah, thanks. It's Simon Hales from City. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Deborah. Um, I just want to come back to LAC again. I'm just still struggling just to really understand what really changed between the end of September with the AGM statement and, and where we are today. I mean, is there something in terms of the internal management inf information systems that you have that meant there's perhaps a delay in you recognizing at the center what was really happening on the ground? How do we have confidence that there's not a risk in other markets of a repeat? I appreciate what you said about like being an isolated incident, but I'm, I'm still just trying to contextualize it all. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I will say, remember, October is a very important month for us. And so there is a lot of information that, that comes in to October. Um, you know, I mentioned in the presentation how much of scotch is sold in, Lat in you know, Latin America in the first half. And the you know, vast majority of, kind of those depletions all happen in sort of that October, November, December time frame. Actually, what might be helpful, because I've kind of talked about it, but maybe um, Alvaro, I mean, Alvaro's here. We've got the president of Latin America here. Um, so maybe if you want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what you've seen, you've been on the ground, I think you have, what, 20 years or so in the region? Yeah, so yeah. Know pretty well. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me well? Sorry that my voice is a little bit soft, but I've been talking a lot <laughs> the last few days. So look, I think, uh, I think the question is about what have changed. Yeah, um, I think in, in August, we signaled some, you know, first of all, some weakness on consumer, some consumer down trading, more volatility than expected, and some inventory issues, as Deborah said, and specific in Brazil. So what have happened after that? So consumer vol volatility continued there, um, but there are two important aspects. One is spirits has been underperforming TBA, which is the first time that we are seeing this. For example, in the case of Mexico, during the last two years, spirits have been growing between 8 to 10%. Q1 showed a decline of five, which was a very rapid change that to adjust for us. In Latin America, Scotch is our largest category, yeah? And 63% of our sales, as Deborah said, happens in H1, yeah? The depletions of, those, of that, the majority is between October, November, and December. So the other important data point was between September and October, when we got the orders, you know, from our distributors, and the modern trade, which is the first channel that we attend, they were lower than what we were expecting. And at that moment in time, we knew that we had a bigger issue that you know, we were expecting for. Yeah? Why is that? It's because we do have, so how, how is our road to consumer in Latin America? We have, we attend distributors, the modern trade, and a few wholesalers. For that level of our road to consumer, we have robust and solid information from sales, stock in trade. The second layer, which is more wholesalers, sub-distributors that goes to the fragmented on-trade and off-trade, we have less information. So, and that has been what is causing the problem for us to really anticipate, you know, the, the, to understand the entire value chain of the stock in trade that we have. So we have visibility of this first layer, 
And this is one of the first actions that we are taking is normalizing this first part of, the, of, the, of our road to consumer. And we are making significant action of that. We are confident that by the end of H1, that job is going to be done. Then the second action for us that we are taking is maximizing our festive season, which is the most important part of the year for us. Yeah? And to make sure that the execution happens to, to accelerate the depletions, to help us to clean what is less clear for us, which is around, and it's just not for us. It's for the entire industry. That is this second layer of a stocking trade and third layer of stocking trade that is in the market. In that context, we are gaining market share. Yeah? And the only market that was an exception for that was Mexico. And during the last four weeks, we are seeing early signs that that market share is improving to get into positive. So I think that was the combination of the volatility after the faster growth plus the visibility that we have in the road to consumer is what we are dealing with at this moment in time to address the issue. We are taking immediate action, as I said, and we are taking this very seriously huh? to address this first part. And then in January, we will have better visibility of after the execution of OND. Very good. And then your second question on, on other markets. Thank you, Alan. Yeah. Um, there are more questions about Lackwood? No? Well, I'm okay. sure there will be questions about LAC, but we know where you are. <laughs> Um, as far as other markets, um, look, this is a, quite a unique situation. Certainly in developed markets, you know, we've, we've got more, um, you know, visibility all the way through that chain. And then, you know, I will say, actually, other emerging markets like, you know, Day Allen will talk about, you know, Africa. At some point, we'll, we'll get them up here, too. Um, but, you know, in places like Africa, first of all, it's, it's mostly a beer business, which, you know, you just, um, because of the expiration dates, nobody wants to drink stale Guinness. So, um, you know, it's just a different uh, setup there. And then the other thing is that that opaque layer is more like a mom and pop shop versus in Mexico where you're talking about other wholesalers, right? So it's, a, it's just a different level there. And then also, of course, John, you know, in APAC, you know, that's another kind of emerging market in the world where sometimes you won't, you don't have as good a visibility, but the difference there, that's quite a luxury portfolio in many of the markets like Malaysia, where it's just, um, you know, you, you, you don't have the same kind of, um, remember, LAC has, has grown in our business tremendously over the past four years. It's a great business with great margins. And we've expanded that, that you know, so over time, you know, you're seeing a lot of growth there. That's really where it can be sometimes difficult to see exactly what's actually, um, you know, true consumption versus anybody building inventory, you know, until they stop ordering. Um, but in this case, I think, um, look, the team is, is absolutely all over it. We will come back to you in January and, and give you an update. Um, but we do feel, um, you know, certainly as we look around the globe, we knew we had an inventory problem in Brazil. Um, certainly we did also flag that we had weaker consumer conditions. But things like this, you know, Mexico thing was really the, I would call it the newer news um, in that five weeks. And of course, this is an important consumption time period. So we will know more about the status of this in January. Chris, Chris Pitcher. <clears throat> uh, hi there, Chris Pitcher from Rebon Atlantic. Um, I, thank you, Alvaro, for all your answers and everything the last couple of days. Um, slightly in your defense, are we, are we missing the real issue here? That, that lack, let's say it missed by 10%, 10% of the group, that's one point. But you put up a chart saying the US market's growing three to four. Your sequential improvement perhaps doesn't mean you're back into positive territory. So actually what's happening here is the US has not recovered as quickly as you hoped to provide the safety net for all the other regions. And so what happened in LAC, we would, in June we were talking about the risk of a cyclical downturn in LAC. We've been through this many, many times. What we haven't been through is the sort of gap you're seeing between the market and yourselves today in, in the US. And actually the US is the issue, not LAC. Well, actually we are, we are still looking at sequential improvement in North America. And remember, we did talk about this is, this is a supply chain that has been normalizing. It is a consumer that's been normalizing. You know, but look, you look over the last 12 months, you know, in measured channels, what is it, 3.8, 3.9% growth. So actually, it, we're getting back. You're, you're seeing from a consumer standpoint, kind of that normalization back to mid single digits. And then, you know, we had said all along it would be gradual improvement. Um, in North America, and so that—that that is what we're seeing. You know, no doubt, 
like you, you know, as you look at North America sort of month to month, it is sort of, you know, I, that's why I say normalizing instead of normalized. But, you know, but certainly we are still seeing that sequential improvement. And so, of course, we would always like to see that come faster. But you also have to remember in North America, we were still cycling. There were a lot of price increases last year, not just us, but elsewhere in the industry. So you still have a lot of things, you know, that I would say that are kind of normalizing out. But we are, you know, we're excited about what we see, you know, from consumer sentiment. We're excited to see that point of sale and the consumer really come back. And the rest of these supply chain things will, of course, follow along. Um, can I, can I just dig I... into the consumer sentiment you put yeah. up? Yeah. How long have you been running that time series? How efficient yeah. has it been proven? And particularly your commentary around a, a quite an optimistic view on the on-trade going into Christmas. That notoriously can change very quickly. Yeah. How, how comfortable are you as that a predictive tool? Because I come back to it. Sequential improvement, you haven't confirmed growth. Yeah. So you could still be negative. And the gap to the market is four or five points, which we haven't seen in a long while. So. How confident are you in those predictive tools? I mean, look, it's sentiment. So as you know, consumers always, you know, actually they usually, we actually find they usually under say what they're going to spend. Most people plan to spend less and then they end up spending more. That being said, um, that's why the most important thing is to really look at things sort of year on year is what I would say. And so that's where we saw this low point back at February, 20, uh, February 2022. Actually, if you look at industry and how the industry grew in 2022, there was not a lot of growth. So actually, that was quite, I would say, quite aligned with ultimately what we saw in the market. And we also have um, external, you know, morning consult and sort of these type of things that uh, there they wouldn't have, they would have said kind of July of, of 2022 was sort of a consumer low point. So we've got multiple, both external and internal sources that sort of pointed to that kind of time period of being fairly low for the consumer and that the consumer is actually feeling better. Remember, this is questions about sort of our industry, right? So, um, you know, I would say, look, we've got great tools like Demand Radar that actually pull in and scrape external stuff plus internal. We see it aligning with what then ultimately we see you know, in the marketplace. But granted, it is, of course, sentiment, and there are things that happen, so it's you know, not entirely predictive. But we do find that when we combine these data sources, we tend to get kind of the best view of it. And we're, we are feeling good that it is not uh, giving us a lower, a lower number. You know, we're, we're quite pleased to see that it's higher. And we get it every month. So yeah. we're looking at it every month, Chris. And so you know, if, it, if it changes, we will see it right away. Robert? Robert Einstein, Evercore. I was just wondering if you can talk um, <clears throat> about your exposure to the Middle East, um, which doesn't look like it's, it's going to get better anytime soon, and, and both kind of the direct impact. Um, you know, I believe you have very large businesses in, in Israel and Lebanon, um, so I'm probably not counting on too much growth there. But also, and more importantly as, as well, you know, how you think other things may happen, things that we aren't seeing today, but you know, if, if all of a sudden retailers have become more cautious, if travel, international travel has started to slow, or any other kind of sort of ramifications around the world that could, you know, that you're monitoring, that you're starting to see perhaps, you know, initial changes in trends. Yeah, you. You, I mean, you want to talk about it, what it means from a group level? Yeah. Or so, you know, uh, the, Look, it's it's not a huge part of the total group, but it it's it's meaning it has had a meaningful impact on Europe. Now, Europe's growth in this half is going to be strong. We were expecting it to be stronger, if not for this uh, the impact in the Middle East. And the impact we're seeing there is the direct impact, as you said, Robert, on Israel and Lebanon, where you know things have come to a complete halt. But we've also seen a significant pullback in the business that we have. In, in the rest of the Middle East, that's in the kind of the Gulf states. Uh, I think there are secondary impacts definitely that we will see from this. I mean, you're seeing the impact, I mean, with the combination of the, of the Ukraine war and the crisis in the Middle East, I mean, you see what's happening in, in continental Europe and GB as well. I mean, people, you know, you're, you're seeing the rallies, you're seeing uh, consumer sentiment uh, being impacted by it. Uh, that's, that's definitely for sure. Um, 
And I don't know if uh, John wants to add something about uh, yeah, global about travel. A global travel point too. I mean, just to set the context. Um, passenger numbers in general are really good. But back to pre-COVID levels. Back in Europe, they're actually yeah, higher. Uh, Sorry. All right, can hear me now. Uh, just to set some context in global travel, just passenger numbers are actually quite good globally, uh, apart from Asia, where the Chinese consumer isn't yet traveling at the rate we'd expected. In fact, in Europe, they're actually higher than pre-COVID levels. But we are seeing a bit of a fallout uh, through some of the uh, Middle East hubs and some travels, so we are watching that. Um, um, so that is going to be a kind of, a, I would say, a secondary um, impact on what, is already, what has otherwise been a relatively buoyant channel for us. Celine? Thank you, Celine Panuti from JP Morgan. Um, maybe I would like to go to a bit more of the midterm, Debra. Um, you presented the presentation, um, the key points today, and uh, um, some of them, as you said, were already uh, from past strategy. So I wanted to understand what do you think you will do differently? Uh, you mentioned that you think you could do better in terms of uh, execution. So if yeah. you could give us a bit of a steer on what exactly that means. Um, I also noted, I know it may be more about Levin, your presentation, but um, that within that midterm, it also means that you are increasing your ANP spend uh, to deliver the, the, the same. So, I mean, is it you can do more, but you need more resource? How do we think about the return on all of that? Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, and you'll get a chance, we'll, you know, we will actually take you through some of these key places where we're really looking to invest behind, um, actually in this next uh, session. So I won't steal too much of the thunder other than to say, you know, I laid out the four kind of key growth strategies. The driving on the, you know, our big brands, that, that is certainly more of a continue uh, of what we've been doing at Diageo, right? We've uh, many of you would have seen like our, our scotch uh, presentation back in May. Um, certainly tequila has been a big part of our growth and is one of our big brands. Um, and certainly Guinness. And so, you know, activating against all of our big global brands is, is clearly a big part and our big global categories is, a, you know, is certainly a chunk. The sort of the newer areas is I think this about expanding some of our footprint around the world. And I talked about this um, you know, actually at the, uh, at the end of uh, fiscal 23 about taking tequila around the world. We'll talk a little bit about that today. There are also pockets of other opportunities for some of our brands, and you will hear from our presidents where we see those opportunities um, to more, uh, you know, more lift and shift, I would say, of some of the really exciting things that are happening. We are seeing the speed of the consumer around the world really pick up on these trends quite quickly. And so we want to be able to be there and be leading in those emerging trends much faster. We also have innovation has always been part of the Diageo. Um, you know, frankly, I think it's a real core strength of ours. Um, we tend to always have some of the best. We, you know, if you think about our share, we tend to always, you know, overshare on uh, on our, our innovation that we launch. But some of these new occasion areas, and I think our, our frame of moving from kind of category and very brand out to really looking at the consumer landscape of occasions and where we can play. Um, so think about all the adjacency sort of areas which, of which you know, convenience has exploded. Um, but there are certainly pockets already of things like non-ALK um, that we really see an opportunity in and really going after these new occasions that are quite not just you know, uh, great for Diageo, it really is quite expansive for the category as well. So um, look, as we look at AMP, and we'll talk about more how this rolls up in the medium term guidance and how this will work, um, we've been investing as Diageo. Uh, we wanna continue to do those investments. There's just some things in the, in the operational, um, in sort of the world that which we'll be operating in that's a little different going forward, but we can talk about that this afternoon. But, and then the fourth strategy on raise, raise the bar on execution, we will, uh, that's in your session. So the final session, we will talk about uh, productivity at length. Um, this is key for us. We see great opportunity here, um, but that is also going to, you know, these are big programs. This isn't just the everyday efficiency stuff. We've got some very big programs. Um, and then also, uh, I am not gonna steal Claudia's thunder and Sally's thunder on what we're doing in North America as well. Um, on execution and specifically around, 
you know, addressing some of this, uh, you know, how we show up at point of sale and our route to consumer. So um, stay tuned. And if we don't answer your question by the end of the day, we'll come back to you. Lawrence. Hi, it's Hi, Lawrence Wyatt right. at Barclays. Uh, Deborah, on, on slide 19 about the, the power of the middle class, uh, you highlighted some statistics on both India and Latin America yeah. about the potential of those uh, growing middle classes. Now, when we look at other sector companies, uh, whether in spirits or in wider beverages, um, often China is highlighted as a key area for the growing middle class. You didn't put it on your slide. Is there a reason behind that? Do you see, um, has your uh, potential growth expectations for China changed recently? Um, how would you interpret no. that? No. So, um, you know, actually, so China, of course, for us, remember, uh, you know, what is it, John, 90% or, you know, or so of, of, of TBA is Baiju. Yeah, exactly. um, which we're in Baiju and absolutely, um, you know, look at that. And we, we do see the opportunity. It's just by the numbers, the India opportunity is, and you just, that growing middle class is really, you know, special <laughs> um, to highlight. And then, you know, look what Alvaro has been doing, you know, putting the Friday announcement aside um, in Latin America, we, you know, we have certainly seen, um, just, you know, great opportunity in, in that too. So um, it was more just about, you know, s size and scope of numbers. We are certainly investing in China. We've got a lot of investments going into Baiju as well as the Chinese, um, the Chinese malt distillery, which is very exciting. I mean, that's just, it's an emerging area where, you know, we'll see how that, how that goes, but very exciting. Thank you, Ann Gherkin with Davenport. I wanted to return back to LATAM and ask yeah. about the consumer and the down trading. Is it different in this economic challenged environment versus past environments? And is the competitor environment also rational as well? Or can you talk about the competitor behavior as well as LATAM? Yeah, so from a consumer perspective, I don't think it's that different. Um, I think what we are seeing is consumer during the last three years, what we have been doing is recruiting consumers from premium beer, and other locally produced spirits. That has been the journey during the last three years. The down trading that we are seeing right now is going consumers from scotch to other categories like vodka or gin, and in some cases to beer, to beer again. But it's not that different versus what happened before. It's just that we are in a so much different position right now from, from its strength that, um, that we are, what we are making sure is that we are playing with the entire portfolio to make sure that those consumers that are down trading are coming back, are, are staying within the Agios brands. And the competitive landscape. And the competitive landscape, it's, it's very active, especially on beer, due to the fact that during the last three years, we've been recruiting consumers from beer. We've been beer very active, you know, coming back to the own trade, coming back to, to, to invest. For an international spirits perspective, we continue gaining share, as I, as I mentioned. Um, and continue to be very active because that has been the case during the last three years about us gaining share. And then Deborah, if I could yeah. return to the U.S., you put up the slide about Diageo, um, U.S. distributor inventory levels within the range, but that data looked like it was through June of 23. Do you have any data that runs through maybe September? What does that inventory level look like in that, in that graph? Yeah, we're still very much in the range. It's just, you know, this is, these are all, um, so actually, I mean, we can look at inventory daily in North America. It's, it's, and, and it's because we're so concentrated, particularly in spirits, we're concentrated in a couple of key strategic distributors. So, um, so yeah, we are absolutely, you know, within that, within say that no, range. No, no change. Just no, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I think, I, you know, unless we get that, that audited, we, we can't ever put things up on the slide. So, um, you know, and our, our, um, our external auditors, you know, look at that, you know, before we, we put that up in a slide. Um, you know, I, I will add, um, because this comes back to how different our Latin America business is versus sort of other downturns. Um, the LAC business now is much more, have, has much more premium scotch in the portfolio versus standard scotch. Um, and that's a real shift versus other downturns. So. Um, you know, so certainly um, even downturning from sort of premium scotch can still land in our portfolio. We don't have to, we don't have to sort of chase that down. We've got now a scotch ladder actually in, in, lat, in LAC that you've built over the last four years. James. 
Um, back to the sell out versus sell in again. Yeah. You, big components of your variable compensation, both bonus and LTIP, are based around sales. So sell in. Have you thought about whether there's a way of adjusting that to, to more reflect sell out uh, and actually pay people for executing the culture? Yeah, I mean, look, on, um, on sell out, like I, I mean, Claudia can speak to this in, in you know, in North America, but certainly in our um, in our, our incentives, we have individual bonus incentives as well. Literally, when you talk to the teams, they will talk about depletions. Like, looking, no other president is saying no. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, literally, that's what people talk about. So it really is about depletions and DNSV. Um, so that kind of measure on the top line. That's a one, you know, that's a one Diageo measure, but the individual kind of regions and the individuals that work within our commercial organization are all about depletions. And in fact, if people end up with inventory that is over, like if it looks like you actually have to come like before, like the, first of all, within the region, you're going to be standing up in front of the region management team. And then it'll even come up to the, to the audit committee. Um, I, you want to talk yeah, about just that? that. I mean, look, I think for the people who are actually doing the selling, their bonus structures is predominantly sellout. Okay. The group bonus is a very small component of the frontline salesperson's incentive structures. Uh, at, the, at the total group level, the other thing that we do have is this, what we call the, um, uh, the, uh, the IRC, the Remuneration Committee. Um, Luis and I sit on it. And before we pay out any bonus, we do have a, a, a quality check where we look at whether the results have been achieved in a high quality way. And so stock and trade is a very large part of that. You know, margin progression is another part of it. So if someone is achieving an NSV number or a depletions number in a, in a non-quality way, we use full discretion to pull back on those incentives. So it's not a... It's not just an, you, you, it's not a mathematical calculation only. There is significant checks and balances that we have internally within the company to ensure that results are being delivered in a high quality way. Oh, John? Um, just, our general managers are focused on one thing, and that is market share. We have a significant and the biggest bonus modifier for any country is the general manager being able to demonstrate that they've grown market share in the year. And that is the delta on the bonus that they get for the entire team in that business. And that's a plus or a minus. Yeah. So I think that's just a really important focus. I was going to say, so yeah. that's even beyond does. depletions, but actually a sellout, of course, to the consumer. So, you know, not all places we have good enough data to be able to, you know, to fully do that. But depletions, but in other words, we are not... This is not, and I'll just repeat this, and we have many, many people on the senior management team that were here 10 years ago, or it's even maybe more than that now, but you know, of, of that kind of selling culture, that is not what it is today at all. So we try to measure as far down in, the, in that supply chain um, as we you know, possibly can as we're putting together incentives you know, for people that are in, in our you know, commercial organization so that there is no adverse incentive there. Um, hi, Jeremy Fialco, HSBC. Hi, Jeremy. Just one question coming back to, to LATAM again. Um, a lot of us here look at many other kind of consumer staples companies across sort of food, household products, personal care, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess we came through this reporting season and pretty much all of the other companies that we looked at had uh, reported actually pretty robust results from uh, Latin America. I can, you know, you can go through the sort of, yeah, double digit growth from many, many other players with a good sort of volume and, and price balance. Um, so, you know, what is it you feel is specific about your categories um, that have me meant that the sort of spirits industry has just been so dramatically different? to what all of these other parts of the kind of consumer staples um, yeah. arena. Have, I think it's uh, I think it's the premium na nature of spirits and what it's become, Jeremy. I think um, that's that's probably the main difference because we are gaining share. So we're gaining share compared to the other spirits. And that's because we do have kind of that that price ladder of which we've got standard scotch and we've got other things that people can trade down into. 
But that is, you know, the, these are quite premium products, and it, it had really been premiumizing, um, which is why we also, remember, have really great margins in Latin America, which um, isn't always the case sometimes, uh, you know, in some of the other, um, you know, companies that, that we might be compared to. Mitch? Thank you. Uh, Mitch Collett from Deutsche Bank. Um, if I can ask another question on LAC, please. So you, you said that you only realized October um, was weak um, very recently. Um, I guess what have you, and you've also said that November and December are very important months. So what have you assumed for November and December with the minus 20 that you've pointed to for 1H? And then... Yeah. Let, um, so a couple things. So we did know the consumer environment was weak. I mean, that's why we talked about, that's how we built the inventory to begin with, that, that we were disappointed by on sort of the World Cup and what was coming after. We saw a weakening consumer environment. I think what Alvaro referred to, so in Brazil specifically, I think we had, and, and, and frankly identified that. Um, I think the Mexico change was the one that, yeah. that changed quite dramatically from our end of year when we had talked about um, that. And of course, we, we were not aware of really having built up big inventory and stock in Mexico. So that was sitting at lower levels, um, clearly. So that that weakening environment, I think that's the big change. I don't know if there's anything you want to add, no, I think it's but that. we can't talk about going I, go I forward. I think it's that. <laughs> what, what we are assuming is that we want um, that to have the better execution due to, during October, November, and December. And that is the best assumption that we have at this moment in time to help us with, to solve, as I said, this second layer issue that we faced. I, if I just add on to that, uh, Mitch, I mean, like one of the conscious decisions we have made here um, as we've come up with this very disappointing issue in Latin America is to keep the business still funded, to be able to carry the depletions out. Because the best thing that we can do uh, is to ensure that yeah. you know we keep a very healthy category, we keep our brands really healthy, and if the consumption happens at the end point, you know, in these very big holiday occasions through Black Friday and Christmas, that's the best solve for any issue that we have in any market, and not, not the least in Latin America at present. And so that's definitely something that we have kept funded. And, you know, that, uh, that, that, that's what we're doing. That, that's our assumption is that, you know, these are good, strong plans as the team have built. And we will keep the business funded to carry the consumption out. And we're seeing that come through. And we, you know, Alvaro and team have weekly data that measures what's happening in, in, from a consumption perspective in the track channels. And we're definitely seeing that. We'll take one final question for this Q&A segment. We'll go with John. Thank you. Uh, John Pregoff from Artisan Partners. I'm just curious, you know, the cost of capital has increased, uh, of course, for everyone over time. You, you talked a lot about the investments you're making. I'm wondering if there are investments you're, you're not making or where the hurdle rate has increased and, and that's caused you to, to pull back in certain areas, just in, a, in an environment of scarce resources, you know, for everyone. I think we're always making choices. I mean, like I think uh, I think that's 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 you know there's as Deborah said you know there's opportunity for us to grow pretty much in every brand and category in pretty much every region, um, and so there's uh, we're always being choiceful about which do we fund first and which do we fund next. And then to your point on the hurdle rate, as the hurdle rate goes up, I mean what we expect to get. Um, you know, from from acquisitions or from any uh, capex expenditure, also go up. So we do update the hurdle rate regularly for all of our uh, investment decision making choices. If anything specific that you would add that we would want that we haven't done? I mean, yeah. You know, I some... mean, look, I and you know, I still come back to this is you know, this is a really critical time you know of the year for us, and um, you know, we do. We are very pleased with um, where we're, you know, the trajectory that we're on in this sort of 90% of the market. And so, you know, and Alvaro's talked, you know, a bit, more than a bit, about um, what all uh, we are doing to try to overcome and get through this, this lack issue as soon as we can and really make sure then that we can, you know, kind of clear that uh, as we go forward. So... Thank you. And I think we're, are we on the Yeah, we're section? on the break until 10.30. Oh, you get a break. Very good.